Francisco to, this, uh, to give this talk. Uh, so I prepared a short introduction about uh, Francesco. I should say I've known him for a, a long time. Uh, he is a, a great friend and a fantastic scholar. Uh, he received his PhD in uh, 2008 from Ludwig Maximilians University in Munich. Then he became a research fellow at CES IFO in Munich. And I was extremely happy when he started at SDU with DS and with my research group, uh, the Historical Economics and Development Group, Hedge, in 2017. I think this was a great sign about uh, the sort of quality of the scholars that we could attract uh, to DS and to Hedge. Uh, uh, sadly, of course, when you attract uh, very talented people, then they have a, a tendency to find something else. So very quickly, uh, he did what was, I guess, somehow expected of him. And in 2019, he landed a tenured job as Associate Professor of Economics at the Department of Economics, University of Bergamo in Italy, uh, which I think, uh, of course, it was sad to see that he would be leaving us, but it was uh, great news and uh, demonstrated the success somewhat of the DS model. Uh, the success of the DS model in terms of uh, promoting uh, excellent uh, young scholars. Uh, he is also a uh, CEPR fellow uh, from in London and a CAGE research associate at the University of Warwick. And he's had all sorts of uh, great visiting positions at various prestigious universities, including Brown University. And he has published, of course, very widely in the fields of economic history, growth and development, and political economy. And he has a particular focus on human capital, education, and demography. There's all sorts of other nice things I could say about Francesco. He's uh, received a lot of grants. Uh, he's a member of a couple of editorial boards, including uh, Explorations in Economic History, which is one of the leading journals of uh, the field of economic history. Uh, but I think instead of using too much of his time uh, talking about him, maybe we want to hear what he wants to tell us uh, now. So he's going to talk to us today, today about uh, flow of ideas, economic societies, and the rise of useful knowledge. And according to the instructions which I was sent, uh, Francesco, you have around about 30 minutes, leaving around about 25 minutes for question and answers. So over to you. Perfect, thank you very much. Uh, it was an extremely nice introduction. And uh, um, I'm very happy to be here. As I said, it's really uh, painful not to be able to be, to be there uh, in Odense, but I think we, we all share this, this kind of feeling. Uh, and as we said off the record before, let's hope that uh, we'll be able to meet again, maybe after, after uh, summer. Um, I'm particularly happy to present this project here, Diaz, um, because it, you will see at the end of the day that it's it's somehow related, I think, also to the uh, to the concept and the idea of of, of Diaz, as a at least as I as, as I saw it when I when when I when I started, uh, so as a sort of platform to uh, share knowledge and and share ideas, and. Um, this project is exactly about that, uh, to, to understand, uh, try to understand how um, and when and what's the effect of, of some particular institutions um, and what we call economic societies, uh, what's the role of these societies in, in uh, sharing knowledge and, and uh, affecting then innovation and technological progress during the Industrial Revolution. Um, just to motivate a little bit, uh, a little bit more, uh, this this uh, project, I think it's uh, getting uh, an established view that the scientific revolution, and in particular the concept of of useful knowledge, um, has played an important role for for the industrial revolution, um, industrial revolution in the in the western in the western world. Let's say um, there are. Uh, um, recent articles that uh, provide uh, empirical evidence, um, starting from from like let's say the theoretical approach, but not not only uh, of of Joel Mokir, uh, who actually was invited, right? So we we uh, we had Joel Mokir at Diaz um, last year or two years ago. I don't remember anymore. I mean, uh, time is is getting flat. <laughs> um, and and um, again, the, the the idea that useful knowledge and and uh, uh, was important in uh, a, a, a huge role in the industrial revolution it's, it's getting more and uh, more established what we don't know exactly in this how this useful knowledge how this this scientific approach then arrived and uh, and reached the let's say the common people uh, the, the the shop floor of of the real economy um, we know that the, it, 
the transmission of, of information of skills um, before uh, the let's say the scientific revolution uh, in the Enlightenment um, was 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 orally transmitted. There was oral transmission um, from from father to son, from uh, on the on the shop floor. Uh, what is called uh, this tacit knowledge. Um, and therefore, there was this um, separation between like the written and abstract word of, of Lord Man and this um, uncodified uh, knowledge. Then starting in the 17th century, uh, late 17th century and, and, and uh, the 18th century, we observed the first really empirical, systematic uh, and, and, and experimental approach towards agriculture, um, arts and crafts. And in, in particular, in the German lands, in the German area, we, this, this transformation, this codification, if you want, of, of useful knowledge, this, uh, uh, again, creation of, of, of the access to, to useful knowledge um, was introduced by the economic societies. So the economic societies are and will be the main object of, of my, uh, my investigation. Oh, by the way, I forgot to say that it's, it is a project which is uh, co-authored with Eric Hornung from the University of Cologne and Julius Korschnik from London School of Economics, um, a PhD in, uh, in, in London. So that, uh, of course, we share all the uh, honors and, and burdens. Um, so this paper then studies what the persistent effects of, of the economic societies on innovation, uh, in uh, we focus on, on on Germany, and maybe we can also give some some ideas about the direction of technical change. I mean, so the the main effect of of these societies in terms of creating innovation, but also in terms of of uh, direction of of technical of technological change. So um, to put things more in context within enlightenment. Um, as I said, the economic societies are probably like the first type of societies to, to promote useful knowledge and, and really practical improvement. So to bring this useful knowledge um, at the, at the let, let's say the low level, um, which is a name which is not shared by other alignment societies. Of course, there were other societies, clearly. Um, reading clubs, scientific academies, most notably. Uh, but uh, if you read the status of these of these two different uh, these different type of societies, uh, you, you see that the, the aim is different, and the exact I mean the explicit aim and target of this economic society was to uh, to promote useful knowledge, and and the practical improvement of uh, to in order to 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 reach some a practical improvement to uh, improve the economic conditions of of. Of the community, and um, so to go a little bit back, I mean to to uh, put put things more more in context. Um, this this practical improvement and, and economic societies uh, first arise in the late 17th and early 18th century in England, um, and and actually in in the. Uh, I mean, United Kingdom. So we have the Dublin Society for Improving Husbandry Manufacturers and Other Useful Arts in 1731. Then the Society for the Encouragement of Arts and Manufacturers and Commerce in, in London in 1754. Uh, concerning Germany, uh, we have a sudden adoption of, of, uh, of rise of, of these the economic societies as a consequence of, of the economic decline due to the Seven Years War. Speaking of Seven years war uh, that happened between 1756 and 1763. Um, and indeed, we observe that uh, a couple of years after the Seven Years War, many, not all, but many of these societies just popped up in, uh, in, uh, in Germany. Uh, again, with the um, aim of uh, improving the economic conditions of the community, of the, of the, local, of the local economy. As it clearly written in the statute of, of this of these societies. So the first wave of economic societies, as I said, then in the so in the sixties, then there is a second wave in the in the seventies, and actually this this movement, this economic society movement, then uh, tend to uh, die out uh, around uh, eighteen hundred. So it is not uh, um, a, a, a very um, so in, in terms of 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 uh, uh, life. 
the, it is, it, it's a really relatively short, but you will see that they have a big, uh, a big impact. They had a big impact. Okay, at least that's what what we claim. Uh, what about the timing? So, um, as I said, in, as we said, uh, as I said, in in, uh, in Germany, uh, we observed this the rise of these uh, societies in uh, the second half of the 18th century, so starting in 1760. And indeed, if we if if we look at the uh, use of of the term improvement, okay, within German books, uh, using using engram, uh, we observe. That indeed there is a, a, a rapid increase in in the word verbessern und gemeinnützlich, which is the uh, again the, the, the German word for, uh, for 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 improvement, uh, exactly around 1750, 1760, uh, which is the the, the time uh, when when these societies uh, arise. So again, uh, just to show you that um, it looks like there is a real um, uh, attention, so to say, uh, uh, and and, and uh, a lot of thinking about how to improve the economic condition, economic situation uh, of of the local economy. And again, this disappears in in, uh, in in books, in German books. Okay, uh, when we look for for the word uh, improvement. So, which are the which was the the mission? Of, of this uh, and the activities of, of these societies. So if you take, for example, the Hamburg society, which was, was one of the most important society, uh, you read that the, the, the mission was to apply every useful result of human knowledge, discovery and invention to practical and civic life. So this is exactly uh, what, I, what I was trying to, to, to say, right? That the, the society, wants to, 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 to apply, to, to take this, this useful knowledge, the useful result of human knowledge in order to uh, improve the practical and civic life. Also we have important civic life because you also will see, you will see later um, for a select uh, subsample of the societies, uh, which kind of people uh, were members, okay? If you take the Breslau society, which was a, a big society, uh, you will see that, that the network later on, um, you also see that um, they were divided in sections and sections such as, uh, for example, history, mathematics, uh, natural philosophy, uh, um, or an important sector of industry, for example, the economy, the factories, or a special branch of public welfare to the constitution of schools or ways to prevent poverty or to help them in best way, uh, et cetera, can be found. found. Um, and here we'd like to uh, also um, uh, you to focus attention on schools, the constitution of schools, which was uh, at least for some societies also one important aspect. So to invest and to contribute also to uh, the creation of, of human capital. So on one side, societies as a, as a, uh, as a place uh, to uh, um, um, convey this useful knowledge to the common people, and on the other side, also as a way to promote the formation of human capital. And, and I'm going to show you how we try to uh, empirically address this point and, and to prove, the, so to say, test if uh, this society has really succeeded in this in this um, mission. Uh, so, which are the activities of these societies? Well, um, they actively promoted the diffusion of user, or useful knowledge uh, by uh, granting prizes. So they promote new ideas by granting prizes and uh, uh, there were lectures. Um, they published journals uh, and, and uh, they had a library and the members could uh, of course have access to the, to the library. Um, and as I said, also they, they, uh, some of them tried to promote progress also through the establishment of vocational schools. And, um, and in, in our uh, perspective, we argue that this, uh, this, this last point, so the establishment of vocational schools um, is probably one of the important mechanisms behind the, the, the let's say our, our main result that I'm gonna show you uh, in, a, in a couple of minutes. To take care about the time, okay. So here's some examples You're using um, some examples about the um, uh, discoveries, uh, the, the useful knowledge that was discussed uh, in, in, in these uh, societies. 
Um, so, for example, the use of, of a mine compass for, for mine surveyors or uh, how uh, what can improve like a host house, which I think was used for, for brewing. Um, or you can see like the, the protocol of, of, this, of a society meeting discussing uh, improvement in, in bleaching, for example. So just three examples. I could, I could bring more uh, examples. We have, we have um, dozens of, of these examples. Again, about uh, the discussion that was taking place there in order to apply this useful knowledge, again, in order to improve the economic conditions of, of the local economy. So what's our contribution? Well, what, 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 what do we bring, let's say, to the uh, literature in, uh, with our project? Um, well, as I said, we, we studied these economic societies, uh, which lived, again, in the period between 1760 and 1800. And we, we analyzed the contribution to innovation during the 19th century. And the main findings are the following. So we find that uh, regions with more society members uh, tend to have more valuable patents during the second industrial revolution. Um, not to rely, since we don't want to rely only on, on patents as a measure for, for innovation, we also look at uh, the world exhibitions uh, that took place on a regular basis, and, and we find that more society members have more exhibitors at, at, at the World's Fair during the late industrial revolution. Another important result, which um, is related to what I was saying before, the direction of technological change, we find that uh, access to the same information network, and I'm going to specify later what, what we mean by information network, but regions that have access to the this, this same information network tend to innovate and in similar industries later on. Okay, so again, it, it, what, what we find is uh, consistent with the uh, in interpretation that uh, this, this society has created a, a network, an information network that persisted over time and that um, affected the, the direction of, of technological change to the extent that, um, again, regions that share members from the same society later on, and I'm talking about 100 years later, will tend to innovate in similar technological classes or in similar industries. How can we rationalize or can we explain this, uh, these main results? So what we, which are the, what we call the mechanism behind it? Um, as, I, as I mentioned before, regions with more society members um, tend also to establish vocation, vocational schools earlier. And it's the vocational schools and then the production, if you want, of, of human capital, the production of high skilled mechanics uh, is, is the, uh, the mechanism, uh, the link between the economic societies and the uh, innovation later on. And therefore the we find, uh, so empirically, that there is this, this relationship between presence of society members and establishment of vocational schools, and that more society members also are associated with uh, a higher number of skilled mechanics uh, in the early phases of the Industrial Revolution, talking about um, period around 1850. So these are the economic societies that we are considering in, in our studies. Uh, study. Um, so these are the city where the, let's say, the, let's call it headquarter of the society is, is, is placed. So we have as you can see, small and large cities, actually. It's not that the society were just in huge big cities like Berlin, Hamburg, Munich, or whatever, but um, uh, they were, it's, 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 a mix, it's a mixed story. So you have big cities um, like Hamburg, for example, but you also have cities like, which are uh, almost uh, unknown, like Burghausen or Bad Homburg, um, and, and which, is, uh, which is interesting. Uh, and and um, poses also some challenges in terms of, of then identification of a causal effect. Um, now, in, in, this, in the spirit of, of the Diaz lecture, I will not go too much into the detail, the, uh, let's say the technicalities of our econometric approach. Uh, of course, I'm open to, to questions if you want to understand or know more. But um, I will try to uh, to uh, so not to uh, uh, go too much into into detail about the technicalities. But it's clear that there are some challenges uh, um, 
uh, if you want to uh, estimate like the causal effect of um, the economic societies on on innovation, but I will def I will talk about it and and try to give you uh, the, the 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 main intuition behind our uh, our approach. Uh, but again, the the thing you to, that you uh, should um, uh, notice here is that the, the societies were not residing in uh, only in big cities. There are different years in terms of of uh, what we call incorporation or uh, funding years. Um, you see that many of them are right after the end of the Seven Years War. So 1765, 64, again, 65, uh, 64 in Leipzig. Um, again, these are uh, right after or a couple of years after the, uh, the, the Seven Years War. And it's clear there is also historical narrative that, that uh, supports this, uh, this notion that, again, Many of these economic societies started as a in a response to the economic uh, backwardness or negative shock due to the Seven Years' War. Here you have the number of the of the members uh, of of the society that we have, have been able to reconstruct using the original membership list of the societies. Um, and uh, we were able to. Uh, to let's say reconstruct, uh, uh, let's say the history of about three thousand seven hundred uh, members, and we we have been able to geolocate uh, three thousand and three hundred uh, uh, members, and that's important because um, if we know where these members were, then we can try to understand whether in those regions where or in 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 a in, in the cell, that's what we call a cell, our unit of observation would be a cell uh, where these uh, members were living uh, if later on there is more innovation and which kind of innovation is there. So this is basically what we are doing uh, in, uh, in, in this paper in our analysis. Um, I was mentioning about the um, type of people, type of members that, uh, I mean, type of people that were joining, joining these, these societies for, uh, again, a subset of, of these societies, uh, we have information on the occupation of, of the people. And you see that the vast majority are civil servants, which is, again, consistent with this, with this notion that uh, uh, the aim of the society was to improve the, uh, the, the, the economic condition of, 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 the, uh, of the society, of the local society. And, and we don't have many teachers or professors or scientists like it was the case in, in a, um, uh, scientific academies, which again, they had a different purpose. Of course, I'm not saying that they were not important for innovation, not, not, not at all. Uh, what I'm saying is that uh, these societies, the economic societies that we are considering were made of normal people, common people, um, again, with a purpose to, um, use in more in a practical way uh, the, the, the discoveries uh, in order to improve the economic uh, the economic conditions. So I'm going to show you a couple of nice maps uh, showing first the uh, spatial distribution of the society members. So each point here uh, indicates the presence of a, at least a member. The size of the the size of the of the circle uh, indicates the the number. Okay, of, of members. So we have points where areas where more than 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 uh, or hundred members, and and uh, areas where there's just one or two members. Okay, and the red dots are the what, what we call before the headquarters of the societies. So we're gonna have um, seventeen societies. Okay, uh, so you, you should see seventeen dots, uh, red dots here, and and this is again. This spatial distribution of, of society members. Um, of course, they are clustered around, uh, around the, the, the society headquarter, uh, but not, 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 not only around the, the, the society, again, the, the headquarters. So they are scattered all over the places. Uh, it's not really, uh, there's not really going on in the, in the eastern part of, uh, of, of Prussia. Which was uh, largely agriculture and and uh, characterized by uh, extensive uh, agriculture. Um, and another thing that you will notice once I show you the spatial distribution of of innovation, 
as measure in terms of, of patents uh, granted in the period uh, from 1877 to 1914. So this is the stock of, of patents that uh, again mirrors the uh, innovative or innovativeness of, of the different regions of, of Germany. Um, we know that in the in the Rhine area, Rhine Valley, there is a lot of innovation going on even today. Uh, and and if you compare, interestingly, if you compare the uh, the members, uh, the distribution of the members with the um, with the patents, uh, you will see that we we will not be able, for example, to explain uh, why there is a lot of innovation going on here, since there are not many members here. So actually, what uh, what what our um, um, society tend to uh, let's say uh, explain is is the innovation going on in the middle part of in the middle part of Germany, uh, in Bavaria to to some extent, and and also the the, the few spots of um, innovation that we observe in the eastern part in the eastern part of of Germany. Uh, why I'm saying that because uh, uh, the the high innovative areas uh, in, in these regions are uh, likely um, uh, determined by, by natural resources. Okay, uh, so the presence of water and the, the presence of, of other, other natural resources that were important for, for example, in, a, in chemistry and, and, uh, and therefore are not related to, uh, to the story that we are here telling about the, the role of, of uh, economic societies in, in spreading knowledge and making this knowledge available to, uh, to the uh, common people. So this is again special distribution of, of uh, patents. This is a special distribution of the exhibitors at the World Fair uh, in, uh, uh, in Vienna that took place in Vienna in 1873. So we codified all the German uh, exhibitors and, and we geolocated them, so the, 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 the origin. And therefore we can uh, complement, if you want, the information on, uh, um, uh, so the information that, that will arrive from, from, from the patent. There is a very strong correlation, of course, between uh, number of patents that were granted in, in one area and, and the number of, of exhibitors at, at the Vienna World Fair, um, which uh, again is, is, is a sign that uh, both are at least measuring the same thing and, and uh, they are both a good measure for, uh, again, uh, for innovation. So as I said briefly before, uh, the unit of observation of our analysis is, is a grid cell. So basically we divide Germany, Imperial Germany in grid cell cells of uh, size of about 15 by 15 kilometers. So we're gonna have around 2,700 units of observations. Of course, if you want to understand what's the effect of uh, the societies on innovation, you have to take into account all other possible confounding factors. That's why for each cell, we are able to uh, assign, uh, to Assign it, let's say, geographic characteristics like altitude, temperature, precipitation, crop suitability, distance to, to, to a major river, which, um, again, in the context of, of uh, innovation in some industry was important. So, water availability, it was always important. Um, of course, you want to make sure that what you are measuring or what you are capturing is not just the fact uh, that the members are in big cities. And of course, in big cities, you're going to have more innovation. So you want to control that count for city size. Um, and we have different different strategies for that, because of course, we don't have um, information for all the 2,700 um, uh, grid cells in terms of how many people were living there. Uh, but um, we, we, are, we have, again, different strategies to, to take into account uh, differences in, in urbanization. What is always important in this context is also the, the local institutions. You might have just different, different set of rules which might be related to the presence of, uh, of, of a society and innovation later on. And we take into account also with these this differences uh, using uh, historical maps and, and uh, drawing the borders of what we call these polities that again capture differences in, 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 local, in local institutions. Um, so here you just have a couple of descriptive statistics. So in our, at the end, data set, let's say uh, we have 
uh, on average 1.15 member uh, across all the district, uh, so district, sorry, the, the cells. Um, and and uh, we have one point, uh, not, uh, around 10 patents and 1.8 exhibitors. Just to, to, to give you a little bit of an idea. Um, so as I, as I said and promised, I will not go uh, into the details in, in terms of the econometric approach, which is uh, pretty uh, standard, straight, straightforward. Uh, so again, we, we, what, what we try to do is to, uh, to predict, uh, right, the, or it, let's say to, uh, to estimate the effect of, of the members in a, in a, uh, in a, in a, in a cell or uh, observed in uh, uh, the period where, um, when, when the lists were, were available, so between 1760 and 1800, and see what's the, and see what's the effect on uh, innovation during the second industrial revolution in Germany. So I'm talking about the period between 1880 until the first world war. Uh, so our, our uh, dependent variable then is uh, again, the count of, of innovations or patents or exhibitors depends on which kind of variable, which, which variable you wanna use. Um, and then we have the count of, of members in a society. And as I said, we, we account for geographic population controls and institutions and so on and so forth. As I uh, promised also, I will uh, talk a little bit about the main concern, the main challenge, because uh, uh, ideally what you wanna do uh, in, with these studies is to estimate really the causal effect of uh, scientific societies of uh, having a member uh, in, a, in a society on, uh, uh, on, on innovation later on, okay. But clearly membership is not randomly distributed. Okay, so the fact of having uh, 10 members in one cell and, and zero members in, in, in the neighboring cell uh, is, is not random, okay? Because then membership could reflect what, uh, I don't know, willingness to acquire useful knowledge for some reason. Uh, it could be related then to economic and, and innovation potential, for example. Or the society's network. So you take just one society uh, and, and the network that we observe uh, maybe uh, proxy some pre-existing network of people that share some common interest. Um, which means that these people or these areas uh, would have been highly innovative even in the absence of a patriotic society. So then of course, what, what we need, the first best would be to have like a natural experiment uh, where you uh, get uh, almost a random assignment of, of uh, a random assignment of, of membership uh, uh, all over the place. Of course, we do not, we don't have such a, such a natural experiment, unfortunately. It's not of course, but unfortunately we don't have such a, a natural experiment. Uh, what what uh, at the moment what we are trying is to uh, to to identify the like, the, the causal effect using uh, like distance to the society seat. So we take like the society seat as uh, as given, and and the distance we, we assume that the distance to uh, to this to the to the seat affect the propensity to become a member to be a member of the society. Which is, of course, inversely related to the uh, to the cost of, of participating activities. Okay, of course, if you want to participate in society, it's costly to do that if it is 200 kilometers away than if it is just five kilometers away from it. And that distance then affects the probability of of becoming a member. Oh, of course, this this uh, logic and 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 uh, approach has is uh, a lot of problems that we try that we try to address in uh, in, in our empirical analysis. Okay, but at, at the moment, I just wanted to give you the the main uh, the main idea, the, the logic of of our approach. Just checking the time. Um, so these are basically the main the main results. Um, the main results showing that um, we find a positive, a positive and, and highly significant coefficient, which, which means that uh, using different specification, um, which means that um, the, the higher the number of, of society members in an area, the higher is gonna be the number of patents uh, granted in the period 1877, 1914. I'm gonna tell you uh, about the size of this effect, okay, of, of, the, of this coefficient. Uh, the thing you have to, uh, to, uh, to notice here is that, again, 
um, if you account for geography, urbanization, these polity fixed effects of the institutions, the type of society, uh, we obtain the same result. Um, um, this IV is, is the, uh, the result that we obtain if you uh, use this, this approach of, of uh, trying to predict the number of members based on the distance to the, uh, to the main seat, and we obtain uh, very similar results. Um, both if you look at patents as an outcome, or if you look at exhibits as an outcome. We do a lot of tests, as I said, to, to, to try to, to convince the, let's say the reader, to convince you that what we are doing, what we are finding is a, is a, is a, causal, is a causal estimate, okay? But I will not go to, um, to details also because we don't, have, we don't have even time to do that. Um, but I would like to, to, uh, to show you then um, the, the size of, of the, the fact that we find. So in terms of magnitude, we find that a 10% increase in the number of society members is associated with a 4.4% increase in the number of valuable patents, which I think is, a, is an important result, not just, uh, so it's a, an economically important result. Um, I would like to spend the last few minutes, um, I think, I hope I still have five minutes, tell me if I'm, if I'm wrong. Go ahead. Um, to, to address this, this, this part on, on uh, which I think it, it is a very important uh, also result, about the information network, about the, the, the impact of this information network. So the, the question that we try to uh, answer here is that does access to the, to the same information network affect the direction of technological change? So does the network of knowledge sharing then determine also the economic geography of innovation? So the, the hypothesis that we test here is that then regions with members from the same society and will tend to innovate in similar technological classes during the second industrial revolution. So what is an information network? Well, pretty easily, uh, we take, uh, this is for example, the, the, the society in uh, Leipzig, okay? Which is somewhere here in the middle. And we connect all the uh, cells that have at least one member of this society, okay? Uh, so it is not just that we are connecting the, the, the cells to the seat of the society, but we are connecting all the possible, again, uh, um, uh, members of the same society in Germany. And so this is one information network. Uh, this is a, a huge, a big one. This is another information network based on the society uh, in, in Mannheim, which is around here. Uh, and again, we are connecting all the uh, um, uh, cells uh, that have at least one uh, member of this society. So what we do now is to consider one segment as one unit of observation. So one pair of cells connected, which means that they share the same information network as, as uh, one observation. And so what we, we estimate the, what, what, what it's called in the, in, in, in a, in, in, in the field, uh, a gravity type equation. So basically what we're trying to do, and again, I will just give you the, the, the intuition, um, we construct an index of technological similarity, okay, of a pair of, of counties. So if these two pair of, of, of so not counties, pair of, of cells, um, patent, a lot, have a lot of patents in the same technological class, they will have a similarity of one, let's say. Whereas if they, 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 they patent, they innovate, but in different technological classes. So one is patenting a lot in, I don't know, uh, brewing technology. The other one is patenting a lot in, in uh, chemist, chemistry, let's say. Well, they, they have like a similarity uh, index uh, that goes to zero. And uh, we, we see that, we, we check, we test if this similarity can be explained by the fact that um, these cells, uh, this pair of, of cells uh, share same members from the same society, or at least that they shared in history. Because again, this is innovation in let's say 1900. The members were there in 1760, 1770. Okay, so these are not the same people. Okay, this is also important to notice. And indeed, what we find is, 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 is the following, that uh, if you have members from the same society, uh, indeed, uh, later on, will tend to, uh, to um, innovate in similar technological classes. 
Whereas if you have members from different societies, there is no effect there. You don't, if you don't see any, any stars here is, is a bad thing in the sense that there is no, no significant effect. Okay, so having members from different societies has no impact on technological similarity later on. So it only matters if you had members from the same society. And to give you an idea about the economic importance of this, uh, of, of magnitude of this um, finding, um, if you account for railroad, so for the fact that these two cells two are connected by a railroad, we find a similar coefficient, which means that the size of the effect is similar. So, which means that sharing the same information network has the same effect as of sharing like a physical infrastructure, which I think is a is a pretty 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 nice pretty nice result. Um, so, to give time to uh, to uh, to discussion, um, I will. Uh, um, I will not mention the, the analysis of doing the mechanism. Uh, again, what, 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 we, what we, we do and what we find, uh, and again, if there are questions on that, uh, I can show you the, the results or I can tell you a little more what, what we do. But basically, we, we have been able to uh, reconstruct um, all, the vocational, uh, all the vocational schools that were established, they were in Germany in 1900. For about 1,000 of them, we have the establishment year. So we can show that uh, the presence of at least a member in, in a cell is an important predictor for the timing of the foundation of the vocational school. Consistent, again, with the notion that these societies pushed for establishing, establishing a, a, a vocational school. So push for, contributed significantly to the creation of, of this human capital, which was then needed to um, operate this innovation, okay? Uh, and in, in a similar vein, we find that uh, in these areas, there are also more highly skilled craftsmen. Um, if you look at the population census in 1849, um, this information is available only for, for Prussia, but again, these are more uh, than 1,000 than cities, and, and we find, again, this, this result. So uh, concluding, um, there is increasing evidence that, again, the technical skills of a relatively small group of, of individuals, not the, the, the so-called tweakers, um, was, 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 was the executive skills were important for the Industrial Revolution. Okay, this is the so-called uh, upper tail human capital. Uh, our contribution here is to, to show you how these econo the economic societies, if and how the economic societies uh, contributed to uh, the diffusion of this uh, uh, useful knowledge, okay, and and how this, the, uh, the the societies work as a again as a platform, if you want, uh, as as a as, as an information network, okay, that was used then to uh, uh, spread uh, this this uh, useful knowledge, um, and we find important important results, um, um, economic economically speaking, uh, in terms of persistent technological similarity and innovation between areas that were. That historically share the members from the same society, which is, which has an important implication. Important implication because again, um, these these networks were important, and even if these networks were are not there anymore, uh, they still have persistent and long lasting consequences for for the economic geography of innovation in this in this case. So I finish here. Thank you very much, and um, I'm looking forward to to your to your questions.